Hi everyone, it's a pleasure being here and I would really like to thank Ishan for having me here. And I am uh, Dr. Varun Rai, a consultant ENT uh, in uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, India. And I shall be talking about silentoscopy and how it has changed the management of obstructive salivary gland disorders. So when we look at the definition, it is basically a procedure that is used to examine the salivary ducts. And a miniature a telescope known as the silentoscope is inserted into the natural opening of the duct as it enters the mouth. This allows the ducts to be explored in its entirety and any causes of obstruction within it to be addressed accordingly. So when we talk about salivary gland disorders, we have the entire spectrum ranging from the simple infective and inflammatory conditions to the more um, complicated physiological deviation from the norms like the hyper and hyposecretion of the glands. We also have traumatic uh, incidences of salivary glands and their ducts. And of course, we all know about the tumors which may be benign and malignant. However, there are a few um, salivary gland uh, manifestations of systemic disorders, which I should be getting to in a bit. So um, it should be made very clear that the tumors are not part of the indication for this procedure. This procedure is only reserved for the inflammatory conditions. We all know about the cycle of inflammation where the obstruction um, in the duct or the outflow mechanism uh, leads to the reduction in the salivary outflow, which leads to stasis of the saliva and subsequent bacterial invasion, which leads to the infection and uh, the clinical symptom that we all know about, acute salivitis. So when we see such a patient, the initial management consists of all the medicines like antibiotics, anti-inflammatory, and supportive measures like hydration, compressors, and gland massage. The role of silagogues is controversial and something which a silentoscopist will tell you not to advocate. Uh, because in the presence of an obstructed gland, if you really increase the salivation, there's more chance of stasis and uh, uh, subsequent painful uh, swelling of, uh, for the patient. And there is a theoretical chance that the obstruction may get um, um, dislodged from its uh, place of attachment. However, that chance is really, really low. So uh, once the acute attack is, has subsided after the medication, we should always, always, uh, you know, have a second look because there's always a reason why this has happened in the first place. A clinical examination should be repeated because in acute setting, most of the features, the clinical signs are obscure. And we do regularly advise lab investigations and radiology, which may be appropriate. The lab investigations as a preliminary test are just routine with special focus towards the viral markers, culture sensitivity, uh, sometimes salivary function tests and renal function tests in the, uh, for getting the radiology done. When we come to radiology, we have a um, large number of investigations which are available to the cell endoscopist. It ranges from first the conventional radiographs, the OPGs, the occlusal views. However, as you can see right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you can see a stone right here on the left of your screen. Now, it's good to diagnose a large stone, but smaller stones may be missed. Stones which are behind the mandibular shadow or behind any dental artifacts are usually missed with this technique. The X-ray silography is uh, slightly better and uh, it does delineate the cause of obstruction quite clearly and gives us a good ductal spatial orientation. However, the use of contrast and it is an invasive procedure, so it's generally frowned upon now. CBCT, the cone beam CT is an excellent tool, but it's really, really only helpful if you're dealing with a stone. Something uh, else which is causing a salivary gland uh, ductal obstruction, it's not really helpful. The MR silography is the investigation of choice when we're dealing with uh, conditions like strictures, uh, stenosis, and glandular problems. Uh, it is also an ex excellent tool for um, silolithiasis, 
with a sensitivity of almost 99%. However, it is a little costly and it generally should be reserved for the problematic cases. The per technique scans are basically for salivary function. But the investigation that we generally rely upon are the ultrasound. And uh, it gives excellent details about the gland, the duct, and the site of obstruction. It is relatively lower in cost. It is repeatable since it has no radiation. And it's a good intraoperative tool as well in cases you're lost. The drawbacks are that it's operator dependent and it needs specialized training. And this, uh, if you could just take a picture, this is the protocol that we follow at our institute. This had been made by me about five years back. And we're still more or less doing um, kind of a modified uh, segment of this. So uh, after all the investigation, the possible causes could be sialolithic acids, which remains the most commonly identifiable cause. There's uh, the stenosis of the duct, which is more common in the parotid than the submandibular. We have the ductal dilatations. We have on occasion foreign bodies. And sometimes all you find is an altered gland ecotexture with no obvious abnormality, and these have to be investigated further. Now, uh, for stenosis, suppose we find stenosis on our radiology. So we go back to our lab investigations and we advise these extra tests. And these are the C anchor, P anchor, IgG4, ACE levels, ANA profile, CRP, and these are to basically rule out the systemic disorders. Uh, specifically, it's Sjogren syndrome, the sarcoidosis, the granulomatous diseases, and uh, specifically the IgG4, which has been known to cause a lot of parotitis. So, uh, where do we lie regarding the treatment? And this is what I call the shifting stone concept. On the first image, we see that the stone is anteriorly placed, and this is an ideal situation for everyone. We can just make a stab incision floor or mouth, take out the stone, and the patient is cured. However, if the same stone was three centimeter posteriorly, our approach changes and we advocate for a gland excision. Whereas the premise should be the same, remove the obstruction and you know, you're done with the case. And the same thing for the parotid, something which is posterior in place, and this is all the answers that we have, just do a massage and hope for the best. And, Something uh, uh, causing additional concern for the posterior half and because of this complicated anatomy of the floor of the mouth. And you see the various, I'll just mark the various structures. The one with the yellow arrow is the duct. The one with the white arrow, this structure right here, is the lingual nerve. And you can see how it crosses the posterior part of the duct. And with the blue arrow, that's the sublingual gland which has been reflected off. So in um, uh, in retrospect, uh, the sublingual gland completely hugs the duct. So the duct is quite hidden and protected by various structures which uh, appear to be quite vital. For someone more daring, of course, there are the open glandular uh, surgery approaches with its own caveat like the scars, which is very obvious. We have the cosmetic deformities. We have the possibility of neural injury and weakness, which is uh, far more than is reported. And uh, in tumors, we definitely, you know, we find a nice plane. In cyanotinitis, it is not really that uh, easy. We do have the problems of retained calculi as well in case of lithiasis. So this, um, the evolution of the endoscope has basically brought upon a paradigm shift, wherein we are moving away from the gland excisions towards the removal of the ductal obstruction, which in this case was um, stones. Uh, what about the cylindroscopic armamentarium? We have the, uh, these are a minimum set of uh, instruments that you know, any budding cylindroscopist uh, should have. A set of dilators to get inside the duct because that's a paramount, uh, of paramount importance. And to do that, it's always recommended to do it under magnification. Guide wires, forceps, baskets, and these are all depicted. And we see, uh, if you can focus on the right side of the top half of the image, we have an operating channel and the, uh, most of these instruments are small enough to fit in through this zone. That's how you operate through it. And of course, as a last thing, a thorough knowledge of anatomy and after having 
done quite a few number of open cases, should we really get into this field? So this has been our experience so far, We've done a total of 417 patients. And uh, from 2016 was when we really, really started getting to endoscopy. Before that, we were getting, uh, doing more of gland excisions. There's, there is a learning curve present. And I shall be coming back to this later. So um, for any silent endoscopist, I mean, the rate limiting factor or the gates of heaven really begin with handling of your ductal orifice, which is the papilla. And these are a few videos depicting it. Sometimes, you know, uh, this is for the submandibular duct. And you see that uh, the papilla opens on either sides of the frenulum, which is in the midline, right? And magnification really helps because you're able to identify the opening. And you really, really need to be gentle with it because any um, forceful entry into the papilla can lead to a lot of um, edema subsequently and make identification virtually impossible. And once you identify it, then you serially dilate it with various probes and dilators till um, the opening is dilated enough to introduce your endoscope. Now, what to do in cases where you can't really find it? And this is a case where, you know, uh, me being early days, overzealous, lost the papilla and had to do a ductal cut down where a small, uh, less than a centimeter incision is given right over the sublingual crest. And you dissect in the soft tissues, isolate the duct, which you can see right in the center of the screen. That's a duct between the forceps. Stabilize it with two stay sutures on either side. That's second stitch just going in. Make a small incision to gain entry. Yeah, you can put your dilator in, and yeah, you're inside. And that's how you deal with a lost or a difficult papilla. For your parotid, Taiba, that's the pap So for your parotid, that's your first clue. It lies opposite the second molar. And you can even do a slight gland uh, massage to express that drop of, sal uh, of saliva that we first saw. And once you see that, it's basically just a matter of you know dilating it. The parotid papilla is much easier than the submandibular and um, but it's a, a more difficult duct to negotiate because of the masseteric kink and the submandibular uh, is slightly more difficult to get in but once inside it's a pretty straightforward duct and this is how we dilate see, uh, serially. So uh, without, uh, without uh, Macharu, let's just get into some case studies because I feel that's the best way we can explain what the procedure is like. So for a distal large stone, I mean, uh, for this, the cylindroscope is, I agree, not really necessary where you just give it up. But the difference between, uh, let's say, a stab incision and what I and we cylindroscopists really propagate is to preserve the sublingual gland right here. We give an incision between the sublingual crest and the floor of the mouth, and we dissect in a plane between that. Once we get below the sublingual gland, that's where the duct is. And you reach directly above the duct, you reach the stone, and yes, it's pretty straightforward after that. This was a big stone uh, with a lot of pus behind it, and incidentally, there was a stone behind this as well, and without the endoscope, we would have probably missed it. So uh, now comes uh, some cases where, you know, the endoscope is really, really invaluable as a tool. And this is a case of a proximally located small stone. So this is the endoscopy being done over a guide wire. This greenish thing that you can see is a guide wire, which guides us to the end of the duct. And wherein we see a pathology, which is right past the primary branching duct. And this is technically within the gland. So once we see the pathology and we have our scope in and we see it's floating freely inside, we have our option. We can either use a forcep we can use a basket and all you need to do is just take care of the obstruction, bring it right out, deliver it through the natural opening, no incisions, no scars, no problems. 
and yeah, that's them coming out. So uh, what happens when, you know, a stone is stuck behind either a stenotic segment or it's larger than the uh, diameter of the duct where it in impedes the easy basket extraction that we saw before. And this is such a case where, you know, you see a guide wire and there's a narrow segment right there. Once we bypass it, we see our stone, which will, you might see that it's, uh, you know, it's really small, it's floating inside. However, when we try to basket it, and we did eventually, yeah, so that's the thing. You see, it gets stuck right there where the stenotic segment was. So the idea was to basically dilate that segment and to facilitate the basket extraction. However, that did not really work. It wasn't dilating it enough to um, really facilitate extraction. So we can use the Holmium laser, which is a fragmentation uh, uh, tool, wherein we break the stone into smaller fragments. And I'm just gonna run fast because it's repetition. And uh, the idea is to basically make, uh, fragment the stone into pieces which are smaller than the narrowest part of the duct, so that you can easily basket them out till the, at the end of the procedure. And this you can see after that much of fragmentation, it's converted to almost like a horseshoe. And a few minutes later, it's just broken down into three fragments, which are then subsequently just extracted to the basket. So at the end of the procedure, you have a nice uh, normal looking duct and uh, no debris, retained debris at all. And that's the last piece just coming through. It just, you had to give it a slight tug and yeah. So uh, next is a really deep, uh, almost an intraglandular large, largest stone. Now uh, for stones which are larger than seven millimeter or with stones with uh, axis, which is uh, limited, you know, you cannot see the entire um, stone. In that case, the laser is not really recommended. In that case, a combined approach is more feasible. In this a small uh, incision is given opposite the last three molars. And yeah, I'll just be focusing on that. And I'll just, uh, I want to just play this video in a little more detail. First is the local infiltration, I'll skip that. You retract the tongue out of its way. This is a radio frequency device. And uh, a sharp cut has come, uh, is made um, parallel to your last three molars. And this is just a mucosal cut. You basically don't want to deepen it with the powered instruments because there is lateral thermal damage. And right below this, after just a small uh, um, amount of this section, the first thing that you see is your lingual nerve. And you see that white is structure right there, and that's your lingual nerve. This um, caudal segment is your uh, sublingual gland, the posterior portion. And right now, our first aim is to mobilize the lingual nerve because we'll need to retract it laterally in order to uh, get below it. And that's where your gland and your duct is. You have to imagine that um, from your convention surgery, this is completely the opposite. The lingual nerve will be above. So there you see the lingual nerve is being mobilized, freed of the surrounding structures, and there the lingual nerve is being retracted upwards and laterally. Blunt dissection is then carried out below the nerve to isolate the duct, and then you see uh, the deep portion of the submandibular gland, and very soon we'll be able to see the duct. Yeah, that's the duct right there, right in the center of your screen. So after that, you can put in an endoscope and just to localize where the stone was. In this case, it was freely palpable. Once, you know, this dissection, it was really not palpable before um, this dissection was done. A slight cauterization just over the duct so that you reduce the amount of bleed. And with a sharp knife, you just give a nick. And that's your stone. And this is really, really deep inside. And voila, yeah.
So what about the parotid distal stone? So um, supposing you have a stone and thankfully for your parotid gland, most of the stones are in the distal segment, which is uh, um, medial to your masseter. And for that, there is an option of straight away doing a papillotomy and approaching the stone. But our uh, us cylindroscopists, we do not like to do that. We like to preserve our papilla as far as possible. So we give a semicircular incision around the papilla, trying to preserve the ductal opening because the parotid papilla really has a high propensity for undergoing stenosis at a later date. Sorry. So you carry out blunt dissection. The first thing that you see are your buccinator fibers and then your masseteric fibers right there. So you basically have to pierce through it and reach the duct. And the duct is right behind that. And you can always keep a constant check by putting the probe in through the normal papilla. So that's another advantage of preserving the papilla. Here you can see that the duct is uh, almost dissected the distal one third. And after that, it's again a simple matter of, uh, you know, just giving an incision over the duct so that you can just take out the stone. And that's your stone right there. And this was a case where we had 20 stones in the parotid duct. So I'm just showing uh, how we approach the distal most segment and we put in the endoscope through here and we carried out the rest of the surgery. So uh, for other cases, for medium to large, like uh, there are many proponents of open approaches and isolating the duct and trying to separate the facial nerve and all that. But uh, for me, the laser is an invaluable tool for your parotid gland because you can get through it without any cuts and you have equally good outcomes. And this is a case where, you know, it was a four millimeter stone in a young lady. She did not want the scar. And uh, yeah, we use the laser. it would not come out with the basket. So I'll skip fast forward a few because you, I have already shown a laser video. And this is how the fragmentation is carried out. It's pretty much the same procedure. It's all hand-eye coordination once you get inside the duct. And um, basically what really matters is just your decision making, which is pretty straightforward. There are pretty uh, decent guidelines on that. So here you see the stone was quite big and we had to really, really use the laser for about 20 minutes and uh, yeah once the pieces were sufficiently small then we could just you know extract them one by one using the basket and in some instances the forceps and yeah that's one of the last pieces coming out and you see it's giving a little bit of a problem but however you're able to get that out and that's you know one of the fragments which has migrated to the tertiary ducts which can be a side effect of the laser so at the end of the procedure, you have a nice, healthy looking duct, a small traumatic abrasion on one side. But you know, these are things which are very, very easily managed with just stenting of the duct at the end of the procedure. And you can see that's where the laser was fired. The duct is nice and pink and vascularized so that we don't envisage any problems happening. At the end of the procedure, we do give an antibiotic wash, which again is, uh, not really supported by literature, but you know, whatever helps us sleep at night. So, so uh, apart from the lithiasis conditions, we do have uh, stenosis as the next major cause of obstruction. And especially in the pediatric age group, we have a condition called uh, juvenile recurrent parotitis, in which you do have this type of a typical picture. Uh, now there are three major uh, differences. Number one, the duct is going to be narrow, as you can see right here. It's quite a narrow duct. Secondly, there's loss of your normal pink uh, look of the duct, the parts which are affected by the disease process anyway. And there's loss of vascular markings. You can see the duct is absolutely pale and white and uh, really, really tight. I'm using the 1.3 millimeter endoscope in this, and it's really, really passing through with a lot of difficulty. Now the normal uh, diameter of the duct is supposed to be about two millimeters. So 1.3 should not have a problem going through. So this is the second segment of the stenotic stenosis. And uh, 
you basically dilate uh, in various uh, ways. Uh, you can dilate using uh, the endoscope itself, trying to just force your way through and use uh, sequentially larger diameters of the endoscope to really dilate the same duct under vision. Or you can use the um, balloon. However, the balloon is uh, a larger instrument and it really needs a much bigger endoscope. Now, uh, after sufficient dilatation, you see the end of the duct. You know, after the stenotic segments, you see a duct which is pinkish in color. And that's where your vascular markings start. So the entire problem of this duct was in the middle, the middle one third. There you see, you know, your whitish duct. At the end of the procedure, you can also see this um, at the superior segment, you can see the scar. And that's, you know, your endoscope doing the dilatation. You have to take care not to tear the duct and be absolutely in the same plane of the duct uh, so that you don't, you know, uh, perforate the duct because that would lead to, you know, you having to abandon the case. And that's how a dilated uh, duct looks like at the end. Slight bleed, always good. Now we have a diffuse stenosis as well, and which is typical in the case of Sjogren syndrome. In this, we again see a pale white duct, and which is um, basically the hallmark of all these uh, systemic conditions: your um, idiopathic stenosis of your parotid gland. And uh, in this case. Uh, because of the diffuse nature, I prefer to use a guide wire and to dilate over it. So you can see, uh, so uh, parts of this video will have a whiteout because you know the duct when it comes in contact with the end of the endoscope where the camera is located, there's a complete whiteout and sometimes you just have to go by feel. And uh, having a guide wire, in my opinion, at least in my experience, it does and this is a segment where you know you can just barely see the guide wire and you see the rings of the guide wire guiding you where to go once you withdraw that's when you see the duct and you make sure that you're not going outside the duct and eventually you reach the area which is uh, supposedly end of the main duct and that's where you want to be yeah at the end of the duct, here we see, now we enter a really, really dilated segment of the duct. Yeah, where, you know, you have all your hallmarks of a normal duct. We have your vascular markings, we have your pinkish segment, you have your branching patterns, you have an absolutely normal. So basically the problematic was the middle one third. And once you've dilated that sufficiently and stented it, um, a patient should, they generally do quite well. While withdrawing the endoscope, similar to a bronchoscopy, esophagoscopy, that's when you really, really get a panoramic view of your duct. And whatever you've achieved uh, with your dilatation, you can really appreciate. And that's us coming out. I'm sorry for the bubbles, but like, you know, uh, at the end of the procedure, we do inject a lot of steroid, which uh, has some anti-inflammatory effect. And you can see how much of dilatation we've achieved. And this is all based on the principle like uh, the flow of saliva is uh, basically uh, proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the duct. So even if you dilate a little bit, it provides a lot of symptomatic uh, relief. So uh, finally coming to our results. Um, so uh, everything which is in yellow is flattering to me, so which is good to know, but that's also comparable to worldwide literature. Um, something that we need to really address and um, study further are the normal ducts with symptoms, with, uh, in patients who have symptoms. And the success rate really, really drops because uh, as of now, we don't know what is going on. The endoscopy, does dilate provide a lot of uh, symptomatic relief in the short term but long term they generally do come back with issues and that's where you really have to be careful about promising too much steroid uh, flushes do help in such patients but uh, that's um, the maximum scope of um, a silent endoscopy in these patients but usually uh, more often than not we do find something 
which is causing the obstruction, we are able to address it quite well. For the sublingual gland, yes, uh, the cylindroscopic is uh, cylindroscopy is a tool to basically preserve the submandibular gland, and um, these are patients who have undergone a sublingual gland oral excision. So, as expected, once you take care of the gland, the results are going to be good. So, thank you so much. With that, I conclude, and I'm happy to take any questions. We do have a few questions from the audience, and I'm just going to read them out of the chat for you. Um, the first question that we've got is, um, what, in your opinion, are the diagnostic investigations in the case of a diffuse dilatation of a submandibular gland duct? Stenosis right in front of it, right? So there, uh, it's only uh, in the presence of an obstruction, there is dilatation of the duct. So in case of a parotid, I would lean more towards a MR salography. However, if you find such a case in a submandibular duct, I would be looking at a stone probably. So in that case, a CT might be enough. But if you want one investigation which can answer all your queries, then MR salography. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got another question uh, from one of my head and neck colleagues. Um, it's, do you suture the ducts that have been surgically opened after stone extraction? If so, which suture do you use? So um, there's uh, two um, um, ways to answer this question. For the submandibular duct, you don't really need to suture because uh, you can just leave the flora mouth. You, uh, some people leave it open. You can just loosely... Um, suture the flora mouth mucosa directly and leave the duct open, it heals pretty nicely. Uh, this is what I had uh, started off with. Over time, uh, if the duct has been opened distally, then I use the 8-0 uh, vitral to just you know stitch it at times, but it's really not required. Now, what I'm doing is uh, just approximating the duct edges and placing a small piece of surgery cell over it. That ensures proper healing. Now coming to the parotid duct, if you've opened it up, you have to suture it because there is a larger incidence of uh, silos heal happening in the parotid duct. And for that, you need your 8-0 um, monocrils, your 8-0 vicrils. You do need all that. Some people do use 8-0 proline as well. And uh, some people use 8-0 um, silk as well, your SNT sutures. But I, I find they uh, induce a lot of fibrosis, so I prefer to use the absorbable ones. Over a step, always. Perfect, thank you so much, Varun. Um, our next question is that, if the use of an antibiotic wash is not supported by literature, what's your reasoning behind, the, behind using it? So, um, you know, uh, there's a, um, a lot of proponents in our conferences who advocate antibiotic wash, thinking like, you know, uh, whatever retained secretion, some pus points which are present behind the source of obstruction, your antibiotic is supposed to have a theoretical effect. And there are people who are absolutely against it. And for me, um, personally, it hasn't shown to be much of benefit, but I would rather do something which would um, help me sleep better at night, knowing that I've done that extra thing rather than not do it and then think about it at a later date. Great. Uh, the next question is more of a two-pronged question. Uh, the first one is that, are you using the new laser from stores, the Claculase, and do you have any experience with the pneumatic lithotripsy device? Okay, so it uh, saddens me deeply. The Calculase uh, 2 has, I think, been withdrawn by the company. The, they're working on the Calculase 3, which should be out pretty soon. That's answering your stores question. Regarding your pneumatic lithotripsy, I've been trying to get it for three years, but apparently they've not released it in India since it's not FDA approved, apparently. So uh, as and when I do gain access to it, I would be delighted to use it because I've seen it in action and it's quite impressive. And to answer your laser question, I'm using the Luminous one, which um, it's slightly cheaper than the stores one, and I think it's quite good. Perfect. Um, so the next question is, uh, what is the average learning curve for developing cylindroscopy skills? 
So um, really, really, you know, most of us EMT surgeons are pretty adept at using our endoscope in both hands and looking at the screen and operating. So that part is um, basically taken care of by our training from day one. The really learn, uh, the challenging part comes from entering into the duct and how to handle the flora of mucosa, your papilla. And that is something that you can gain experience directly and indirectly. Directly by doing a lot of diagnostic style endoscopies, at least attempting in patients who have um, already been counseled or planned for your, you know, your gland excisions, your head neck cancer uh, surgeries, where they're about to undergo a neck dissection either way. Just spend five minutes, you know, familiarizing yourself with the papilla and getting your movements correct and trying to dilate it. Um, I think 20 of your papilla handling and you're able to get inside and you can just start. I mean, there's no, and you learn about their decision making along the way. It's, there are a lot of guidelines, there are a lot of books, there's now a lot of text. It's made things much simpler now. Um, great. And next question that we've got is that, is there any concern with post-instrumentation ductal stenosis? Yeah. So whenever, uh, as you can see at the end of every video, we always make it a point to withdraw the endoscope pretty slowly just to visualize any abrasions of the duct, any, um, you know, injuries. If we see any injury, regardless of whether it's a submandible or a parotid, I will stent the duct. Usually these heal without a consequence in within 48 hours. So that's how we manage any uh, ductal problems. Perfect. Um, um, our next question is that uh, the traditional teaching says that obstruction is more common in submandibular, submandibular gland. Is it the same in your experience with salendoscopy as well? Oh, definitely. I mean, let me just go back to the the results slide in case I'm still sharing the screen. I don't know. Yes, you are. Absolutely. So it's almost a ratio of, um, oh well, maths was always weak. <laughs> Two is to one, right? More or less. So, uh, you know, being a referral center, um, as you go on, you get a lot of uh, referrals for particularly the parotid glands. And the, for your submandibular, a lot of patients, um, people are still doing, you know, your gland excisions, your intraoral dissection. So uh, over the years, you tend to get less of some mandibular glands. That's what we've seen, unfortunately. Perfect. Uh, so in your practice, the next question is that when would you elect to go for a gland removal if obstructed? Um, for me, uh, the only indication in uh, cases of uh, obstructive uh, inflammatory lesions is a failure of cell endoscopy. If I'm unable to get to it, uh, like a stone was really, really deep inside. And um, my options of a combined approach, laser, have all failed. Then yes, gland excision is still, you know, the fallback option. But that will always be a fallback option, option for, for me personally. Just to follow up on that from my point of view, uh, would there be any case in which you'd go for a primary gland excision without uh, option of salendoscopy before it? Uh, stones which are large and present in the lower pole of the submandibular gland where very less, less amount of glandular tissue is still present. Yes, you would go for a, a gland excision, but we've reverted to, uh, we've, sorry, resorted to an intraoral approach for those as well. We don't go external anymore. Brilliant. That's really interesting. Uh, there, there are a few more questions. I'm just going to keep going on. Uh, the next one is, um, how long do you leave a stent if you put one in? It depends on for what indication. If it's, uh, as we discussed, a small ductal abrasion because of instrumentation, I leave it for just three days because I know the duct is going to heal in 48 hours. In the case of, uh, let's say, you know, I've uh, done a small papillotomy, a small incision on the papilla to deliver a stone. I would tend to leave it for about five to seven days. However, if a stent has been placed because of the primary uh, reason why the endoscopy was done was stenosis, uh, I try to leave it for at least four to six weeks. Perfect, brilliant. Um, our next question, I think you've already answered this in your talk though, is that uh, would you do a cone beam CT or a conventional CT for stones? 
Well, it really depends on, uh, you know, what option is available to you. A cone beam CT uh, definitely um, has lower radiation, so it's much safer for us to uh, advise our patients. And it provides equal amount of information. So it's better to expose the patient to a lesser amount of radiation if you can. However, non-contrast CT is just as good. It's just depending on what you want to do. Right. Uh, our next question is that how long would you wait for an elective procedure of salendoscopy after an acute presentation of a patient with obstruction to uh, the emergency department? Okay, uh, so my basic criteria is an absence of pain, right? And on my clinical examination, if I press the gland and I see clear saliva coming out from the opening, that's when I'm good to go. If I find a lot of mucus plugs, a little bit of pus discharge on expression of saliva, I would still wait. I would give an extended course of antibiotics. Ideal situation. Cool, brilliant. Uh, our next question is that how would you, how do you usually deal with an intraoperative bleeding, um, especially if it happens intraductly and you cannot see to complete the procedure? Have you had such an experience? Yep. So um, uh, thankfully, there are no uh, really uh, major blood vessels within the duct. So there's never any uh, incidence of a major bleed, right? It, what really happens is a mucosal bleed. In case that does happen, what you can do is add a little bit of adrenaline to your irrigation mixture and uh, just flush and wait for three, four minutes and it all settles down. And the physical act of, you know, uh, of using that irrigation mask, that uh, slight mucosal bleed anyway. If, uh, you remember that video where the dilatation? Can I just go back? Yeah, yeah please do. Okay, so, one sec. Okay, so you see this last case, which I had shown the little bit of bleed right at the end, right? So as long as you know I'm irrigating the duct, you don't really see the bleed right here. It's only when I stop irrigating, you see the duct collapsing. I've stopped irrigating, uh, irrigating, and that's where you see the bleed. If you can appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. So just your irrigation is um, good enough to tampen out that slight mucosal bleed. Brilliant. Perfect. Uh, so our next question um, is. Do you prepare the patient for gland removal at the same sitting as a salendoscopic attempt to remove the stone? So, um, first three years of my practice, that was a blanket consent taken from all the patients, to be very honest with you. Whether it was a mid-ductal stone or uh, something which is quite reachable. Now, uh, my basic criteria is if I can feel the stone, if I can palpate it, then I know I'll be able to take it out. That's one. Secondly, um, the cases where, you know, you have your deep parenchymal stones. I always take a consent for a gland excision and I give the choice to the patient whether they want it in the same sitting or a different sitting. So that is left to the patient. Perfect. Um, we still have a few more questions. So you're quite popular right now, Varun. Um, What's your approach to the management of a mega duct? Uh, I assume we're talking about the parotid, right? Um, I am not sure. Rami, is that true? Would you mind just typing into the chat and letting us know if that's what you're talking about? We'll just go on to the next question and wait for uh, Rami to reply. We are, the next question is, um, how much does the equipment cost? <laughs> Uh, I think we'll have to take the company people on panel to answer that question. <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed very, to Very answer. diplomatic answer. Uh, yeah. Going back to the previous question on mega ducts, yes, it's the parotid duct that she was talking about. They were so, talking about. Uh, the parotid mega ducts are usually, usually due to uh, papillary stenosis. So all you have to do is with the same open approach that you saw for the distal stone, you have to do that slight dissection, isolate the duct right there. And what we've been doing with quite a decent amount of success is that, you know, uh, the parotid duct can be mobilized up to about almost a centimeter. So what you do is excise that piece of mucosa, which is uh, where your papilla would be, 
bring the duct forward and then you suture it end to side. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think it should. It, it, it's quite clear what you, um, how, how you mentioned it. Yeah, you basically bring the duct outside and stitch it to the buccal mucosa. Basically and, bypassing the papillary stenosis. Yes, and you just take out that part of the mucosa. And you uh, try to make sure that your opening is uh, quite large because almost about um, the subsequent stenosis after your procedure is going to leave that opening almost uh, only about one third of what you originally made it out to be. So. Perfect. Uh, Varun, I just have one question of my own and I think um, probably a lot of people here may not have realized that a lot of your procedures you do under local anesthetic. Is that correct? So um, there are set indications in my mind uh, about general anesthetic, right? Okay. So something with... Um, which I envisage is going to take me longer than 30 minutes, I'll prefer to do under general anesthesia. Someone, uh, pediatric patients, of course, under GA. Then you've got your patients with an exacerbated gag reflex, patients in the um, old age patients who are anxious, uh, patients with comorbidities. I would not take the risk of doing them under local anesthesia. Stenosis, dilatation of your parotid um, duct, it depends if you've really, really found out um, your um, degree of stenosis on your MR, if you've gotten an MR done, and you know it's not going to be that much uh, work that you have to do, that can be done under local. However, stricture dilatation generally is quite painful. So that is another indication for your general anesthesia. But apart from that, simple distal stones, uh, basketing, we all do it under local anesthesia. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Varun. I think that's the end of all the questions. I think there's just one more question uh, asking about a good hands-on course that you would recommend uh, for yeah. silent endoscopy. Okay. So uh, there's one held every year, apart from this year, of course, uh, at Geneva. That's where I started as well, five years back. Um, they do the cadaveric dissection on... Um, um, Pig heads, I believe. And then, of course, uh, uh, there was a conference uh, which was scheduled in Egypt, Alexandria, which I was supposed to go. Um, that has been postponed because of the current scenario. And that, I think, has been uh, rescheduled to either October, depending on the conditions. And that's where we are offering the cadaveric uh, hands-on courses as well. And those would be fresh, uh, frozen human cadavers. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Varun. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. I think everybody has appreciated your talk quite a lot, and I personally do appreciate learning so much more about silendoscopy, which isn't something that we get a lot of experience in um, ENT here in the UK. And I think we've got uh, we've had um, people uh, tuning in from across the world today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.